Thank the Lord for that. So Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So would everyone agree here that we all go through hills and valleys at times in our lives? Anyone ever been on top of the hill? Anyone ever been on top uh, in the valley? I feel like we're always either going into a valley or coming out of a valley. For those of you that might not know what I'm talking about, a valley is a place of trying. It's a place of tempting. It's a place of refining. The valley is a time in your life that you go through some kind of a struggle. It could be a physical struggle. It could be a spiritual struggle. It could be a battle with depression, a season of not feeling worth anything to anyone, not feeling love like you should, a physical uh, sickness in your body. It's any struggle in life uh, that it feels like you, you don't know how to get past it. We need the Lord to show up for us, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the heel is a place of victory. It's a place of rest. We have been tried by the fire while we was in that valley. This caused the impurities to come to the surface and be dealt with. Now that we have overcome the valley, we can stand up on top of the hill or mountain and shout in victory. <clears throat> so the mountain in this scripture that we're talking about right here is, is referring to difficulties that we face. God is a miracle working God. And if we ask him for help in a time of struggle, if it is his will and we don't doubt, he will send us what we need to overcome. Amen. 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 So I want to minister to y'all for a few minutes a message titled Hills and Valleys. Hills and Valleys. We're going to talk about valleys first. We all end up in a valley at some point in our life. If you're a Christian and you haven't faced one, don't worry. It's coming. None of us want to end up in a valley, but oftentimes we find ourselves in the valley of decision. We have to make a decision of who we are going to serve while we are in the valley. Will we serve God or will we serve ourselves, which is really serving the devil? The truth is we all want to shout from the mountaintop, but we must first learn how to shout in the valley. Yeah, Satan, is always, Satan always wants to tempt you at your low point. Satan will always present himself as exactly what you think you need in a time of famine or a time of struggle in your life. The Bible says that he transforms himself into an angel of light. This means that he pretends to be what he is not. And this is one of the reasons why it is vital to have the Holy Spirit living inside of our heart, leading us, guiding us, and navigating us so that we don't fall into Satan's traps. Yes, Truth is, without Jesus, all we know how to do is make a mess of things. <laughs> Anyone ever made a mess of their life before Jesus reached down and saved you and pulled you up out of it? Many times uh, people go get into a valley and they turn to the wrong things, drugs. Alcohol, smoking, gambling, it's all to fill a void in their life. Millions of people are on depression medication because they are dealing with struggles in everyday life and they are trying to block it out with medications or they're trying to drink away their problems. This country doesn't have a gun problem. It has a heart problem. You're born messed up, sir. You're born messed up, ma'am. Your situation is not the problem. Your sin is the problem. All the other things that you're, side, that you're dealing with are just side effects, but the root cause is the inward bent of the heart. A heart that is bent towards sin, like a piece of iron is bent a certain way. When we're born, our heart is bent towards sin. It's bent towards doing what is wrong, and it's all because we're born of Adam, born into sin. We're born messed up. We can thank Adam and Eve for that. A couple of scriptures to, to support that is Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, As by one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So uh, Adam and Eve died spiritually, but also physical death came into the world because Adam represent all, he represented all of mankind that passed on to all of us, except Jesus, Jesus because amen. he came Perfect. from another seed, from another power source, which was the living God. Amen? Amen. So we're all born the same way. We all have a sin nature. The nature inside of us is to disobey God. Satan is waiting to turn your trial into a destruction. He wants to destroy you. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. We have an enemy tonight that is seeking to kill you and to destroy you. And he wants to take as many souls down to hell as possible. So two kinds of people in life that I feel like face trials and valleys. And we all fit into one of these two categories. Lost people, saved people. We got lost people in the world and we got saved people in the world. So the lost people, many people live their life doing their own thing. Everything's all fun and dandy. Life is all it pops and unicorns. And one day that person faces a terrible dilemma in their life. God is hoping that this person would turn to him in the midst of their situation. So he sends someone to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. They put their faith in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Holy Spirit moves into the inside of their heart and they have been saved and preserved from the wrath of God. So lost people, God allows them to go through something in hopes that they would turn to him in the midst of their trial. They may have tried all these other things in life. Maybe they finally to a point where, where uh, that person would turn to him. And we got saved people. The seeker sensitive church or the seeker sensitive message would tell you that, you know, saved people don't go through anything. Once you're saved, you don't have to deal with anything anymore. But I'm here to tell you that's false doctrine. That's a lie. Some parents teach their kids from a young age that Jesus Christ is the only way. And it doesn't just have to be a young kid. I'm talking about anyone that whether you're 10 years old or you're 70 years old, if you have gotten saved. Uh, and Jesus said, your personal Lord and Savior, everything may be going good in your life as a saved person, but one day a terrible dilemma faces you. And what it is, is God wants to test the faith of the believer. God wants to test your faith to see if it's genuine. We don't need more faith. We need pure faith. He wants to see what will come out of us when we are pressed by life. Will we run to him or away from him? Amen. Go his route or our own route, accept his plan, or manufacture our own plan. You can read all four Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Amen. The Garden of Gethsemane, it, it literally means oil press. Jesus knew what was about to happen. He will be betrayed and taken to be crucified for the sins of the world. And as Jesus was praying, he began to sweat. Great drops of blood. Jesus asked his father to remove the cup of wrath from him that he was about to drink. But every time he submitted to the father's will, not my will, father, but your will be done. Not my will, father, but your will be done. You see, when Jesus was pressed, blood came out of him. His blood represents that which is most precious to him, which is his love. Thank God we didn't have to bear that. Thank God he bore that for me. Amen. He loved us so much he was willing to go to the cross and die for sinners like you and me. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to do what we could not do for ourselves. I hope you understand that if mankind had something to offer God, Jesus would not have had to come. That's right. But we didn't because we all fell with Adam. So there was someone else that had to come and keep the law perfectly and die for us. And when we put our faith in that plan, we are saved. Amen. Amen. So I don't, ex I don't expect us to be sweating uh, drops of blood when we're in a trial. Mm -hmm. But we should pray like Jesus, not my will, Father, but your will be done. In the midst of your trial, your struggle, your valley, not my will, Father, but your will be done. So what I want to ask you is, uh, what will come out of you when you're pressed? Love or hate? Faith or rebellion? My will or his will? It's one thing to accept Jesus into your heart, but it's much different when the time of testing comes and you will be tested. If you haven't been tested, you will be tested one day. None of us are exempt from this. Right after Jesus was baptized by John the, John the Baptist, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan came to him and tempted him. He tempted Jesus three times and all three times Jesus quoted scripture to him. We should read our Bible. We need to put the word of God in our heart and shut it up like a fire down in our bones like Jeremiah said. But don't think that your quoting of scripture to the devil is going to back him down. Because if you turn that thing into a work and think that you have to quote scripture to be right with God and he'll, that he'll show up for you, that's not how it works. Now, if we're quoting scripture to remind us about what Jesus did, which he was the one that defeated that's the good. devil, not myself. 
We need to quote scripture at the devil and remember what Jesus did for us, what Jesus did for me. That'll back him down because Jesus broke the power of the sin nature that was inside of us. Amen? Amen. So can I tell you this evening that God is the author of these trials. He allows us to go through trials so he can mold us, form us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a prophet, but I know the will of God for everyone here is that you be molded and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. He wants to give us a backbone. He wants us to stick. And as we rely on God, I start seeing some of his character in my life. I need some more of God's character in my life. We all need more of God's character in our life. Gold is passed through fire fire to get the impurities out. Just like we are allowed to pass through valleys to get the impurities out of our heart. God wants to show us what's in us. We might not even realize that there's something in us that doesn't line up. But whenever we go through that trial, he's going to show us what's in Lord, I didn't even realize that was in me. I didn't even realize I would go my own way in the midst of a trial. I thought me and you were good. Yeah. You know, he wants, he wants to show you what's in you. And that's why he allows us to go through trials sometimes. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. I'm going to get a sip of water away. I'll turn there. Romans 5, 3 through 5. It says, we glory in tribulations also. No. A tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost that has been given unto us. So tribulation worketh patience. The trial, the valley that I'm going through, it's working some patience into me. I'm having to be patient. I wait on God to show up for me. One other word that uh, some of the translators would, would prefer to use is endurance. So we'll go ahead and apply both. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm having patience worked into me. I feel that we all need more patience, but I'm also learning to endure and stay under and keep on walking through that. So uh, patience gives us experience. Experience means I've been there already. He showed up for me last time. He's going to pull me out this time. Another word could be character. His character is being molded into me as I'm patient. As I endure, I gain some experience, I gain some of God's character, and experience gives me hope. Hope means I don't know when, but I know so. I don't know when God's going to show up for me and pull me out the valley, but I know he's going to because I have a hope. Because I've been through something before, and he pulled me out that time. And I'm over here in the valley again, and since he pulled me out last time, he's going to pull me out this time. So biblical hope is I don't know when, but I know so. It's like the rapture. I don't know when the rapture is going to occur. But I know it's going to happen. So this is not a false hope. God's love in your heart encourages you on in your hope. And this love is poured out by the Holy Spirit. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's talk about hills for a little bit. So we all want to be on top of the mountain. But we need to realize it's not always an easy climb to get there. We do know that once we get to the top, it will be worth it. It will be a place of comfort, a time of rest. The sight from the top is amazing. I know me and our family have been to Tennessee many times. We've been hiking. I actually proposed to my wife under a waterfall. <laughs> Wasn't planning on telling you that, but let me tell you, I was rolling up that mountain. I was trying to get up there. I was ready to, to I hate to say get it done. I was looking forward to it, but I was a bit nervous. I was leaving everyone behind. I don't remember how long it took to walk up there, you know, maybe an hour or something like that. Wasn't sure. Grandma was in excellent shape. I wasn't sure if she was going to make it. I was about to grab her, put on my back, and take off with her, you know. But we got up there, and the sight was beautiful. It was amazing. That's why I proposed to my wife again. But has anyone ever climbed a mountain like that before? We went hiking, and how, how beautiful the top was, right? So how do we get on top of the hill? We have to trust that God has our back. We place our faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross, that he was raised, raised back to life. This makes me justified in the eyes of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. You're pretty much already there if you flipped through what it's just now. It says we are justified by our faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So justification is not a feeling. It is a verdict over your life. When you place your faith in what Jesus did for you. God looks at you and says, justified, not guilty. Amen. Amen. Not guilty. And it doesn't stop there. Innocent 
of all charges that was against you. Amen. We ought to clap for that. So the Bible says he forgives us of our sins and he separates them as far as the east is from the west. So because you're justified, you now have peace with God because you can now have a relationship with him. This relationship gives me access to grace. What is grace? Grace is God's goodness giving to undeserving people. I didn't deserve it, but God gives it to me anyway. It is divine assistance. Divine is God. Assistance is help. God's help. Help. I need some help down here. Does anyone else need some help down here in the midst of your valley, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your struggle? Lord, I need some help. Webster's Dictionary says it this way. Unmerited divine assistance in one's regeneration and sanctification. So grace is divine influence on the heart and reflection in the life. God is cleaning up your inner man, removing things that don't need to be there, putting things in that do need to be there. And because of this inside job being performed by the Holy Spirit, it is now showing on the outside. The inside has to be cleaned up before the outside can become pure, right? People can now see this change. You now want to tell people about Jesus and you have new godly desires. So we don't walk around all week down and depressed like, oh, Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to get through the week. I'm having troubles at work, having troubles with the employee, having troubles with my boss. Whatever it is that you might be going through, we have grace to stand up no matter what we're going through. You have grace to stand up and do what God has called you to do, to be wherever God has called you to be. And you have access to that because you are justified, not Amen. guilty, innocent of all charges. You don't work for this grace. We don't work for grace. When you're young, you're taught to work for something. Anyone, anyone's parents taught them to work? You work harder, you get paid more. We don't work for grace. The harder I work, I don't get better benefits. The harder I work, I don't get more benefits. Every benefit I will ever need was paid for 2,000 years ago by my Jesus. Hallelujah. Can anyone else say the same? Yes. Nothing needs to be added to that. Nothing needs to be taken away from that. Jesus said, it is finished. It was done. It was completed. There need not be any more sacrifices. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is my second favorite scripture in the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're getting rebuilt by the master carpenter, by the master builder. You wouldn't add brand new wood to a termite infested house. You would rebuild it just like we are being rebuilt and reconstructed. God isn't adding new things to the old you. He's adding new things to the new you and he's taking old things out. Amen. So the gospel message is what it takes to get on top of the mountain. It is to know that no matter what, God has my best in mind. He will not tempt me above what I can handle. And if I wait on him, trust in him, he will bring me through a valley and I will be shouting on top of the hill in victory. The walk isn't always easy. It isn't always quick, but it will be worth it. Amen? Amen. I don't want you to think just because you're justified that the Lord's just going to reach down all of a sudden and, and pull you out your valley. What I'm trying to tell you is when you're justified... God sends you some grace and allows you to continue walking through your valley until the time is right for him to pull you out. So don't misunderstand me. We all need God's grace to continue on through our valley so that our character can be molded and we can look more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. We do have to watch we don't get complacent and satisfied. It's very easy when you're not going through anything to start slipping down the mountain. We quit seeking God as much. We quit praying. We quit, we quit reading. We find ourselves back in the valley. And it, has, that anyone, has, that, has that ever happened to anyone? I've seen it happen a lot of times. Someone decided to turn to church because they said they couldn't uh, get pregnant or something like that. Or maybe they lost their job. They start going to church. Wife ends up getting pregnant, have the baby, everything's good, quit going to church. You know? We get complacent at the top. Don't think that just the valley is a test. Because it's also a test when you're on That's top. Good. It feels easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But God wants to see what you're going to do even when you're on the top of the Amen. hill. Right. Or you're on the top of the mountain. So don't get complacent. 
Keep seeking him. Keep trusting in him. Leave your faith in what Jesus did for you, whether you in a valley or on top of the hill. Amen? Amen. So four points I want to give you. Now, I prayed about it. Could have given you three or four points for being in the valley, three or four points for being on top of the hill. I said, Lord, that's way too many points. <laughs> so the Lord gave me four points that apply to both. <clears throat> Amen? Point number one. You are right where God wants you. You're right where God wants you. Whether you're in a valley or you're on top of the hill. Now look, if you are an unbeliever, you have never been saved, I can't tell you that you're where God wants you. Because you're not. Because God desires to have a relationship with Praise His creation. God. Praise God. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wanted to have a relationship so bad with you that He sent His only Son to die for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. So I can't tell you that you're right where God wants you if you're not saved. You need to get saved. If you need to get saved, come on down. We'll take care of that right now. Praise Amen. God. But you're right where God wants you, whether you're on the top of the mountain or whether you're in the valley. I want to tell you that Jesus, no, point number two, Jesus is with you. He abides in me. I abide in him. He lives in me and I live in him. He's always with me. He's always in me. I'm not alone in the midst of my situation. You're not alone in the midst of your situation if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Jesus goes with you wherever you are. Or he lives in you, reaching people through you. Amen? Amen? Point number three. Have a thankful heart no matter what. That's right. Have a thankful heart no matter what. You want to upset the devil? Somebody says, I don't want to upset the devil if he's already breathing fire down my neck. If you want to upset the devil in the midst of your valley, thank you, Lord. I don't know why I'm here, but thank you, God. I praise you, Lord, in the midst of my situation. Thank you, Lord, in the midst of this valley. If I'm on the mountain, I need to be thankful, too. I really need to be thankful yeah. when he pulls me out, puts me on top of the mountain. Amen? Amen. So I have a thankful heart no matter what. So point number one, you're right where God wants you. Jesus is with you. Have a thankful heart no matter what. Point number four is have peace. Jesus is our peace. And the Bible says in the peace of God which passes all understanding beyond human comprehension. I have that kind of peace. Because Jesus is my peace. It says all the, that, that the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if I continue to leave my faith in Christ, I will have peace in the midst of my trial, peace in the midst of my situation, peace when I have an issue with the boss, peace whenever my kid strays away, whatever it is, you know. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to kind of summarize it. And the reason I bring up this story is I feel that it, it demonstrates all four of these points for us, all right? So Jesus and the disciples were sailing across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus falls asleep in a storm of wind causing the boat to take on water. And they, they were in jeopardy of sinking. But they woke Jesus up saying, Master, Master, we perish. We out here about to die. And you over here sleeping. I tell you what, I want to be like Jesus in the midst of my situation. I could just sleep through it. And I ain't got to worry about nothing. But they said, Master, Master, we perish. Jesus wakes up and he rebuked the storm. And there was a calm, Luke said. There was a great calm, is what Mark said. In Mark 4.39, Jesus, when he woke up, he said, Peace, be still. Peace, be still. Somebody tonight needs Jesus to say, Peace, be still. In the midst of your battle, in the midst of your situation, just trust in him. Amen? Amen. So how many people are going through a trial? You ain't got to raise your hand. I just want you to think about that. Somebody always has it worse than we do. You hear clothes, you got shoes on your feet, you can see, you can hear, you're not paralyzed, you can walk. We always take the little things for granted. Somebody out there is in a wheelchair wishing they could walk. The person bedridden is wishing they could be in a wheelchair. There's a person laying in the grave that is wishing they were bedridden so they could just have one more chance to turn from that sin or turn from that addiction and accept Jesus Christ. There's a soul down there in hell just hoping for one more opportunity to make the right decision that won't get it. Decisions have consequences. Our decisions on this side of the grave affect the other side. 
The decisions that I make in this earthly body, on this earth, they affect the other side. They affect where I go. They affect where you go for all of eternity. I'm not talking about for a year, 10 years, 100 years, or 1,000 years. We're talking about eternity. There's no unbelievers in hell. The moment an unbeliever splits hell wide open, they do believe. But it's too late. It's too late. I talked about this last time. It's Luke chapter 16. I'm going to go over it again because we got a lot of people who weren't here last time. Briefly, Luke chapter 16 is a story of a rich man and Lazarus the beggar. And Lazarus, Lazarus the beggar was on the outside of the rich man's gate. He was begging him for food. It says that the dogs came and, and licked his sores. This guy, he, he was living in poverty, didn't have any food, didn't have any water. He was sick. That'll blow up some, some doctrine. The fact that Pharisees and the Sadducees, they thought that, that your riches and where you lived and how you lived, that that was a blessing from God and this man was cursed from God. But God's about to blow that false doctrine up right here because they both end up dying. And Lazarus the beggar is carried into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man ends up in hell. And he's in hell being tormented by a flame and he cries out, Father Abraham! Send Lazarus over if he could just dip the tip of his finger in some water and cool the tip of my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham said, there's a great gulf fixed between the two. What does that tell us? You don't walk back and forth, because if the rich man could have walked across to Abraham's bosom, he would have did that, but he couldn't. He was being tormented. He was conscious of his brothers up there that weren't saved. Telling Abraham, send one back from the dead to go and tell him about me. Or to go and tell him about Jesus. So they don't end up down here with me. We need to come back to the foot of, foot of the cross. The foot of the cross is level ground. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. The preacher has to come the same way you do. Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Well, there's no other way that works. That's right. You see, man in the world will tell you that there's many ways to heaven. There's many ways to God. But the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Amen. Buddha can't bring you peace. That's right. Jehovah's Witness can't bring you peace. Mormonism can't bring you peace. Mary can't bring you peace. Islam can't bring you this peace. Paul said we preach Christ crucified. That's what he told the church in Corinth. He said, I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that's the only message that works. A message that God ordained from the foundation of the world that he would send his son Jesus. It's the only message that would save the sinner, set the captive free, and give the believer victory in his or her life. You know, everything else I just named it is plans that man came up with. But to have peace with God, we must have a relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not, you don't have to go to it. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through uh, 36. <clears throat> it's the story of Peter walking on the water to Jesus. So the ship was tossed with waves. The disciples saw what they thought was a ghost, and they cried out in fear. You see, the thing that had come to save them, they thought had done come to kill them. This valley or this trial that you may be in, you think it has come to kill you, but it has come to save you from yourself. So Jesus tells Peter, well, get out the boat and walk to me. So Peter gets out the boat, starts walking on the water to Jesus. And what does he do? He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he starts looking at the wind and the waves around him. Whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus and start relying on our own self and wondering how we're going to get through this, you know what we do? We start sinking in the midst of this valley. Right. And what does he do? The Bible says he began to sink. I don't know about you, but I've never seen someone begin to sink. Because whenever anyone else I've ever seen, when they step into the water, they go underneath. But whenever someone can walk on top, when everyone else goes under, uh, underneath, I believe that's significant. And I believe if he would have kept his focus on Jesus, he would have walked all the way to him. But what did he say whenever he began to sink in the midst of that situation? If you have just one word that you can say, make sure it's Jesus! That's right. Jesus! He said, Lord, save me! If you can get two words out, say, Jesus, help! Yes. Help, I need some help down here. And what did Jesus do? 
He reached over and he pulled him out. I believe Peter walked on the water the second time, back to the boat with Jesus, and got on into the boat. You might feel like I'm jumping around right here, but no, cool. this is for somebody right here. When you seek God in prayer, be ready to act on what he says to do. So many times I've seeked God in prayer for something in the midst of my situation. And the Lord spoke to me, and it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So you know what I did? I kept on praying. Thinking God's going to change his mind. <laughs> and he don't. If you had a place to pray and seek him, listen to when he speaks to you. I mean, you're only, you're only delaying your growth process or whatever's going on. The Lord wants to show up in the midst of your situation. So if you seek him and he tells you something, do it. Amen. The next part. How many of y'all like a Chinese buffet? Chinese buffet? Who likes a Chinese buffet? Brother Troy, you like Chinese? Oh, yeah, I love Chinese. All right, I love some Chinese too, brother. So when you go to the Chinese place, there's probably, what, 30, 40 options maybe? I don't yeah. know. I'm just guessing. And Franklin, I don't know where y'all eat over here. How many would you say you really eat, though? About five. Five. I would say I might eat six to eight. Why? Because I've tried everything else, and I didn't really like it. I'm here to tell you, God is not a buffet. Yeah. You don't just say, oh, I tried this and I don't like this. I tried that and I don't like that. <laughs> God is not a Chinese buffet this evening. You either all in or you're all out. Mm -hmm. There's no lukewarmness. Well, you can be lukewarm. It talks about in Revelation chapter 3. And I could wish you was cold or hot, but you're neither cold nor hot. So I will spew you out of my mouth. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Don't be lukewarm. Don't treat God like a buffet this evening. If you've been doing that, get up out of there, Lord. I want to be a partaker of all of it. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you, I treated God like a buffet when I was living out in the world. And I'm not going to tell you much about the situation, because last time I was here, we shut the power down in Patterson. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not going to get too deep into it, to it but <laughs> that's the truth, too, now, for whoever wasn't here. Amen. It was dark in here. We opened the door. Yeah, but guess what? That light lives inside of me. God. The light lives inside of you. Amen? We didn't need physical light in here. The light came down into the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That light lives inside of me. We was going to keep having church that time, and we did. Amen. But I treated God like a buffet when I was living out in the world. I did. And I found myself in a very bad depression. And you know what? Things started falling off of me that didn't need to be there. I was raised from a young age. Jesus Christ is the only way. But I strayed away from it a little bit. I still continued to go to church, but I was treated like a buffet. I'm in church on Sunday, smelling like a little bit of alcohol here and there. Shouldn't have been doing that, but I did for a little while. But when the time was right, Jesus reached down, picked me up, set my feet on the solid rock. His name is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? If God got you to it, he will get you through it. Wait on him. Trust in him. Believe in him. A four-letter word I want to uh, encourage you to use tonight. I said it earlier. Help! Help! Lord, I need some help down here. If you don't know what to do, say, Lord, I need some help down here. Leave your faith in what Jesus did for you. Makes you justify. You get access to the grace of God. Amen. The cross is the doorway that was opened. That everything that you would ever need can flow to you from God, to you, as long as I keep my faith in what Jesus did for me. The spiritual victory that was won that day. Satan and all the powers, they were defeated. And he made a show of them openly, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. But tonight I want to give you four words. This too shall pass. Whatever you're in tonight, whatever valley you're in. This too shall pass. It didn't come to kill you. It came to save you. We need to realize that. God's not purposely going to kill you. Read the story of Job. Satan was allowed to make Job go through some things. But he, he couldn't kill him. And you know what? Job came out of that thing a whole lot better than even when he went into it. The only power that Satan has is whatever God allows him to have. So don't think that he's going to kill you this evening, whatever you're going to. It will pass. It's only a season. It's only a season that you may be in. The Bible says God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power. Not a spirit of fear, because a spirit of fear is not from God. 
God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I can have a sound mind no matter what I'm going through this evening. Psalm chapter 23. I know we got a lot of scripture coming to y'all, but I, the Lord has given me so much, man. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's what David said in Psalm 23. And if you scroll on down towards the bottom, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So not only am I not alone because Jesus lives inside of me, but I have goodness and I have mercy because goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. You're not alone. You have Jesus. You have goodness. You have mercy. Amen. Amen. We should have an assurance in our heart that God has got everything under control. Faith says God is able. He can and he will. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I need to press on no matter what. On the top of the hill, in the valley, I need to press on. Amen. And I want to bring it back to the starting scripture of Mark 11, 23 and 24. I'll tell you what, we just, we're going to go ahead and read it again, just to bring it back up real quick. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe. You know what that means? Have faith. Have faith he's going to do it. Even if you're going through a struggle, you're going through a trial, you Maybe you're doubting if God's going to show up for you. But he's telling you right here to have faith. No matter what. Believe that I can do it. Because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Hallelujah. He raises people from the dead. Causes blind eyes to see. And deaf ears to hear. That's what my God can do. What can your God do? We all got the same God here. Amen. Amen. I pray that we do. If not, we're going to take care of that in a minute. So we shouldn't just know that God can move the mountain at a difficult time. We should know that God will move it because we have a history. I have a history with God. That he didn't leave me where I was back then. He didn't leave me in the midst of my trial. He didn't leave me in the midst of my depression. Brother Troy, you have a history with God. That brother went through a lot of things back in the day. Look where he's at. He's sitting in church today. Listening about hills and valleys. He went through some stuff back then. Some other people in here went through some stuff back then. Maybe you're going through some stuff right now. But you have a history with God. He didn't leave you back then. He ain't going to leave you today. Right. Amen? I want you all to know that the devil is not greater than our God. Amen. While it might feel like we're losing and the devil is coming out on top, he hasn't come to the last round with my God. He's not fighting me. He's fighting my God. God will allow me to go through some stuff so he can show me that he's greater than the money crunch. That he's greater than the sickness. Greater than the marriage issue. And when the time is right, he will reach down, pick you up, set your feet on the solid rock. His name is Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. So don't quit. There's one thing God can't use, and that's a quitter. Don't quit. If you won't quit on God, God won't quit on you. If you won't quit on God, God will not quit on you. That's right. Get a sip of water. As I was preparing this message... I felt over and over the Lord want me to tie in. It's in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. That word buffet, it means to strike, like strike with a fist. This thing that came to Paul to strike him, this messenger of Satan. The great apostle Paul, the one that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he wasn't exempt. None of us are exempt again. But God knew because of the great revelations that he was receiving in regards to the new covenant, in regards to what Jesus did on the cross, the shedding of his blood. But Paul was receiving such great revelation. He knew that Paul would have began to exalt himself. He would have began to become prideful. So God allowed his stone in the flesh. I'm not here to tell you whether it was a a physical ailment, it could have been a physical ailment, something spiritual, something emotional. I mean, everywhere Paul went, great persecution. He, he was persecuted greatly. The Bible says that he was given uh, 40 stripes, saved one five times. It means he was given 39 stripes. He was shipwrecked. 
He was in jail. All these things. Could it have just been that? That every way he went, he had to see the faithfulness of God show up so that he could continue to do what God had called him to do. He was given a thorn in the flesh. Somebody tonight has a thorn in the flesh. We may all have a thorn in the flesh. Something that you feel like has been tormenting you. But can I tell you that one day, I feel in the very near future, that the rapture of the church is going to take Amen. place. And you know, the Bible says that, that, that Paul prayed thrice. He prayed three times for God to remove this thing from him. And as far as I know, God never removed it. What happened was Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul began to know that when he would have become weak, then he would become strong because God would send him some grace. Jesus would send him some grace because of what he did for him. That doorway that was open. Amen. But the rapture of the church is coming. And even if you have to deal with that thorn in the flesh, even if it is for the rest of your life, we need to, based on this message, we need to believe that God can do whatever we need him to do. I'm not telling you not to believe that. That's what, it's, that's what the text said. We need to believe that he can do it. But what I'm telling you is, if you're like Paul, you may have not just prayed three times. You may have not just prayed a hundred times. You may have prayed a thousand times, Lord, take this thing from me. And he hasn't did it yet. But there's a day coming that the rapture of the church is going to occur. Yeah. And we're going, up, we're going up out of here in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. That the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible. And all the rest of us will be changed. Incorru corru corruption will put on incorruption. Mortal will put on immortality. You see those people that have died in Christ. They experienced the corruption of the sin nature. They died in Christ but they physically died. But there's a day coming when corruption is going to put on incorruption. No longer with a sin nature, with a glorified body. Because when we see him, we will be as he is. So that's the day in Christ. Corruption will put on incorruption. But mortal will put on immortality. That's talking about us. All the rest of us that are in Christ. See, you are mortal. I am mortal. We are subject to death. But mortal will put on immortality. You, we will also have a glorified body that when we see him, we will be like he is. At the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, uh, sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and all the rest of us will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. I've had a couple dreams in the last like two years of the rapture. And I made it every time. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what the Lord was trying to tell me. I feel that what he was trying to say was that it's soon. It's soon. Yeah. It's soon. And actually, the, the last one I had, there's probably a lot of people I hadn't told us to, even in my family. But the last one I had, uh, I was, I just kind of dozed off a little bit. And all of a sudden, I, I looked at, uh, at the moon. It, it wasn't, wasn't too dark yet. Just kind of, uh, I don't know, the moon was huge. And all of a sudden, I just took off towards it. Whew, through the air, fast. Every single time it happened, I just took off so fast through the air. But whenever I woke up, like I was being pulled by something, even in my sleep, like something was pulling me. And it wasn't nothing demonic, because I didn't wake up feeling like that. It was a good thing. Something was pulling me up out of that chair. The rapture of the church is coming. And I feel that is very soon. Amen. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's above and not beneath. The root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star, the king is coming back. Jesus is coming back on a white horse. The one that sat on it was called faithful and true. And his eyes were as a flame of a fire. And on his head were many crowns. He was clothed with the vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. He had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The beast and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. An angel from heaven cast Satan into the bottomless pit and shut him up for a thousand years. We will, we will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him one thousand years. And after the thousand years, Satan will be loosed for a short time to deceive the nations one more time. The fire comes down out of heaven, devours them. The devil is cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, to be tormented day and night, forever and ever, for all of eternity. The adversary, there's going to be an end coming to him. And John saw a great, a great white throne, talking about the great white throne judgment, and all the wicked are judged according to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast down into the lake of fire. John saw a new heaven and a new earth. And he said, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, 
a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. God shall, this is what I'm getting at right, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. So if you're dealing with a thorn in the flesh, you're dealing with a, this valley that you're in or whatever, that's going to come an end to it. Even if you have to deal with it for the rest of your earthly life, there's going to come an end to it. But there's a reason for that. The Lord might know that you would become prideful in your own heart. He wants you to continue to seek after him because he knows what you're going to do if he removes that thing from you. So it did not come to kill you. It came to save you so that you would continue seeking him. Amen. I want to remind you, which the Lord reminds me all the time when I'm going through some kind of a valley. I want to remind you of the far greater situation humanity was in because of Adam. Because Adam fell. We would have all, we could have been born, well God could have eliminated him in the first place. He could have just killed Adam and Eve and none of us would have ever been. But he didn't. We saw that he had a plant in the garden. And he killed animals. And the shedding of that animal's blood and the giving of his life and providing coats of animal skins. For Adam and Eve, I want to remind you of the far greater situation humanity was in. But if God is willing to send his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven. If God had that beautiful of a plan for so terrible of a situation, the Lord always reminds me of how small my situation is compared to that. And he reminds me what he has already done. I had an old life where I used to live out in the world a little bit, but I have become a new creature. Amen. There's coming a time that you won't have to go through valleys anymore. You won't have to have a thorn in the flesh anymore. There's coming a time where we'll be able to live on top of the hill in victory for all of eternity. Amen. All of eternity. And that's what I want to encourage you with. For all of eternity, you can come back. Baby. For all of eternity, we'll be able to live on top of the hill. So keep seeking God whether you're on a hill or if you're in a valley. The time of testing is in the valley. I mean, we should be happy when we're in that valley. We should be. I know it's hard. I'm not, I can't say I'm always happy in the midst of my tribulations, but we need to realize it did not come to kill us. It came to make us stronger. It came to make our faith stronger. Because God will do something with that. He, he'll, he, he, he's increasing your faith in Him. Because you're seeing Him show up in your life over and over and over the faithfulness of God has shown up in mine over and over and over. And I feel that it has shown up in everyone's life here in some way, shape, or form. I mean, you're, you're over here in church to hear the word of God tonight. Amen? Amen. 